Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Open and Plenary on Sunday of the 1993 International Space Development Conference. I'm Greg Allison, conference chairman. And some of you may recall those fortunate few who were at uh, the luncheon yesterday with Scott Crossville. He uh, kind of was bemused by the fact that uh, we were asking an aero guy like him to come to space conference. And he said, well, it must have something to do with the atmosphere. <laughs> that, that somehow we, that, must, we, that must have something to do with getting into space. And well, precisely it does. And uh, I think Dr. Buzz Oliver here has something to tell us about that. And we have a speaker, of course, who don't really need an introduction this morning. Dr. Buzz Oliver uh, is most remembered for his historic feat of walking on the moon with the first flight with uh, Neil Armstrong. Now he's chairman of the board of directors of the National Space Society. Uh, he has demonstrated his enthusiasm for space colonization by leading such uh, even activist activities such as the endorsement of uh, call for the Pioneer Space Frontier, the petition that we've got. There's a lot of words for our petition, but anyway, essentially it's a petition we're running to uh, promote going back to the moon and on Mars and greater things. But he has a lot of good ideas he's going to share with us here this morning. So ladies and gentlemen, I give you Dr. Buzz Oliver.
large torus of uh, Werner von Braun is a wonderful idea, a marvelous idea. It gives us living conditions in the free fall of uh, orbital flight. And a large number of us feel that a spacefaring nation really needs to provide a bit more of the living comforts in space. And uh, I can remember an early diagram uh, produced on a memo from John Young to the astronauts. And it, a lot of his memos didn't get very far. They got about as far as his immediate boss or two. And then for some reason, it never really was submitted much further. Uh, in some ways, I'm trying to represent some of those feelings on the outside. There, there really isn't anyone that can tell me not to do what I'm doing. A lot of times I may hesitate because uh, for political reasons or whatever, I may realize that that's not the best path to, to irritate too many people in one direction or another. <laughs> uh, anyway, John Young's memo about a space station had artificial gravity in it. And, uh, and, and I think that uh, uh, comforts of that nature are possible. And, and I'll uh, get back to that a little bit later. But you have to be cautious because some people uh, think that when you begin to do that, that looks like real empire building. And uh, in this world of economic uh, austerity, the competition is, has the spark the space movement has been replaced by a competition for the winning economy of the world. And we're caught up in that. Whatever we do is going to be governed by the economic drives of market involvement and trade. And there are trade items that are good and there's some that are not so good. The not so good ones involve nuclear proliferation and the transfer of uh, scientific know-how uh, into areas that we just as soon not see it go. And the reason I'm just bringing that up is that there's an awful lot of that capability in the former Soviet Union now and uh, there's a competition among economies to see uh, where things are going to work out in the in the future, in the long range and the short range. For the most part, the short range tends to govern. That's the squeaky wheel that gets the oil. Uh, I have probably more view graphs than there are people in the room, so <laughs> I I could uh, could go through trying to give you nice generalities, but generally this early in the morning you're not going to remember them anyway. <laughs> I got into town the day before yesterday and looked at the paper and it said there's a Memorial Day weekend. And I, and I just glanced a little further at the little article and I, uh, I sort of cracked up because uh, the guest speaker <clears throat> at a ceremony is a two-war veteran. Anyway, the title uh, of his discourse is freedom is not free and I thought how appropriate <laughs> <laughs> we certainly are finding out that the SSF uh, is not quite free and that seems to be what a lot of the discussion is all about um, I'd like very much to talk about returning to the moon and how to do that and going on to Mars and, and uh, how I've learned that when you have a good idea, a really, uh, really contributing idea, like continuous orbits going around somewhere, if it isn't someone else's idea, they're not going to help you sell the idea. They're going to find things wrong with it. Well, I've been able to find a lot of things good and bad about it, but I don't think we'll uh, get to that point in this discussion. We may, because uh, I just came from a case from Mars uh, meeting and digested some of the things that were being proposed there. I think what we need to talk about today, however, <clears throat> is the number one priority for the future of uh, human spaceflight. And I wish I could tell you that, that human spaceflight absolutely depends upon 
having a space station in the very near future. I'm not really convinced that it does, but I think right now the case has been made far stronger that our future as we see it with the present slightly modified NASA or a vastly changed reversion back to an advisory group and something that stresses more of private enterprise ability to, to develop. I'm not sure that's going to come out of this particular uh, administration. Uh, th there are a few things that I've jotted down that I, I think may be worthy of note and maybe coming back to that have happened since we had a go-ahead uh, back in 1984, uh, almost 10 years ago, for a space station. A lot of people felt like Von Braun that this was a big place in orbit that was going to assemble vehicles, be a place of refueling, and a place to come back to. And there are a number of reasons, I think, why even the ideas of uh, National Commission on Space and Tom Paine uh, have been revised somewhat in our thinking as we've realized just how difficult it is to put things together in space, to assemble them in space, just stick by stick. And maybe that's because of the method that we chose, stick by stick in, instead of unfolding or deploying. We chose the stick by stick and we, we rejected that, gone back to the pre-integrated item, piece by piece, that then fits together. But because of the difficulties of constructing things, I believe the whole idea of a port facility in space it has to be deferred to some point later on. Lunar missions aren't going to be assembled, I don't think, piece by piece in the heat shield at a facility in space, and I don't think coming back from the moon we're going to take the trouble to recover things at a facility in low Earth orbit. I've yet to convince myself what it is that we want to recover in low Earth orbit, look at, refurbish, and then use again without being uh, looked at here on the surface of the Earth, especially if it involves a human being. Uh, tanks, we may want to leave wherever the highest energy level is. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of movement toward refueling, that is pumping propellant from one tank to the other, and if we did, what do you do with the empty tank that you brought it up with? I think the movement far more is bring up tanks and then connect them to something else if you want to uh, use again or refuel something. <clears throat> um, anyway, let's start with the slides before uh, I run out of gas. Uh, the world really has changed, and, uh, and in our audience is uh, the, the artist that put this together, uh, Dan Gauthier. How do you pronounce that? Okay. I just for some news here. Uh, next. Now, this is something that is projected for uh, 1995, and uh, exactly whether we will have uh, a space station like this in orbit, whether it will be uh, serviceable. Some of those things remain to be seen, and, uh, and I think what's happening is that uh, the Russians are trying to get as much support to try and have the eco economies of the world that can afford to help enhance what they'd like to see happen. They'd like to play their cards uh, accordingly to try and obtain a much, as much support as they possibly can from the European community or from the United States. And I think the ploy of talking about putting a Mir 2 space station in 64 degrees may be part of that. Uh, they know full well that uh, right now, without some major changes, we can't support that. And uh, they may hold that as a, a card like saying, if, <clears throat> if you don't help us in our space station, we'll go ahead uh, and put our, the rest of what we have at 64 degrees, and, and uh, the Europeans can work with us, but you can't. <clears throat> anyway, I think that uh, this mission may be about all that we can officially talk about now, uh, but as soon as we move a little closer to this one, there may be others just like it. Right now we're talking about a fly-around mission in, uh, in about a year, in November 94, and this mission is uh, November of uh, 
95, and of course people at Rockwell are, are working on the interface uh, here to see just what that is, and I hope that uh, <clears throat> they're looking at it uh, so it would apply not only to this exercise, but whatever's developed to join things together can also uh, be applied to uh, whatever our space station ends up being. Um, this is what uh, the configuration of Mir is right now, and uh, they're in the process of trying to move uh, a certain number of modules. I, I guess maybe this shows them already moved, the, the, the solar panels that were, uh, <coughs> that were on uh, Crystal. Now, they, these are going to be moved uh, over to here, and that requires an EBA that uh, hasn't been done yet. Now, there are two more modules that uh, may be added, Spectre and uh, uh, Perota. And if they're added, then we have a firm indication that the Russians are really committing their resources to uh, 51.6 degrees. I guess if someone were to say, well, what would I really like to see? <clears throat> I'd probably like to see us try to adjust their assets to 57 degrees uh, because then we could access resupply from the Pacific Missile Range as well as the Atlantic Missile Range. We'd get more coverage of the Earth, and I'm not sure that <clears throat> the requirement uh, is that much more severe to go to 57 than it is to, to 51, as far as uh, lessening the amount that you can put up there. <clears throat> now, it, is it worth taking any of the Russian assets or just leaving them there at 51 degrees uh, and shifting everything like near two to 57, I don't know. But it's something that might be considered in, in uh, any particular negotiations we might want to do. Thanks. Uh, this is uh, Mir 2, and um, I'm told by those who, who are quite familiar with the uh, dimensions of it that it's surprisingly smaller than, than Mir 1. Uh, I don't know whether this indicates they haven't really made up their mind whether photovoltaic <coughs> or solar dynamic is better. <coughs> I don't think they've uh, built this particularly. Uh, and there's a slide that we'll get to a little bit later that will show uh, a proposal where I think they'd like us to contribute <coughs> significantly in the building of this. But anyway, Mir 2 is an option. <coughs> Now, this is uh, part of a briefing that I gave uh, at the earliest opportunity I had to the uh, redesign group. <clears throat> I had the uh, cooperation of an of a outstanding Grumman uh, CAD CAM model maker, engineer, and a very uh, talented person who, who knows an awful lot about the assembly sequence and the different pieces that are put together. So he was able to be very helpful and figuring out how to take a little bit of this piece and a little bit of that piece and come up with something that, that really made sense for getting things up in a hurry. Uh, modularity is what uh, I've been trying to stress primarily. Uh, and and uh, I've learned since then that you don't want to show the results of modularity maybe too much because then it gets branded as too costly. And that's the category that, uh, that this was placed into so that they didn't have to look at it any further. Uh, next. We, we made some changes and we eliminated certain things. We've actually eliminated more here. Uh, but we took pieces of truss and made them smaller. We made use of a uh, pressurized logistics carrier at one time, and, and even now there is something that's called a uh, closet module that goes up there and it just doesn't have a, a port at the other end, but it's up there at the station to be uh, used to store excess things in. It's just a way of uh, accommodating what you'd like to do in the future with a downsized module. We originally started out with a 43-foot module and then we downsized to 27 feet. Uh, what I think uh, people are interested in in this press for the short term is how fast can I get something going? And that's what Congress wants. They don't really care whether 
things last very long, <clears throat> or whether what it is you put up as a degree of flexibility. It's just how soon can you get something going. So that, that is a pressure in trying to come up with a concept. <clears throat> and there, there's an error in this, obviously. Uh, this first launch, this is the second, third, fourth. <clears throat> the first launch, you wouldn't deploy the panels because you don't have any propulsion and any guidance up there. <clears throat> uh, we elected to put in a 30 degree uh, cant to the panels for clearance purposes and I'm told by the people that engineer this that that would not be a big difficulty. <clears throat> but aesthetically, it's a change. So we've taken that change out. But I believe it could be put back in uh, where it's necessary. <clears throat> what this shows is essentially the existing Freedom first launch. There's really nothing changed at all about this. And it, it's slightly overweight right now. <clears throat> the, uh, the next launch, we modified a few things, added the same radiator that's already in existence here instead of a new and different radiator. <clears throat> These uh, holders here are for propulsion units. They're already up there. So we brought up propulsion and then put this kind of combination piece of truss <clears throat> that had uh, control moment gyros and uh, other consumables in it so that when the node comes up next, <clears throat> with a little piece of truss that should go out to either side, that has to be assembled, <clears throat> it'll have to come up on the same flight and, and be put on because of the geometry of the uh, cargo bay. And there are a few little details about how this doesn't quite extend as far as it should so that uh, a propulsion device can be put down here. <clears throat> but anyway, one, one more launch, number four, could put a lab up there or something else, and you're really in business at this point. You've got power radiators, propulsion guidance, and pressurized volume at the end of three. Now remember that. If I start out here, I can, in two launches, have power in one direction or another direction. Uh, I was, uh, I put this chart together, or we did, when we thought we'd have maybe a way of projecting three different levels. But I'm only showing you one level because uh, you may want to stop there. I want to stress austerity uh, in what I'm doing now. <clears throat> we elected to hold on to things like um, the alpha joint here. And when we put additional power up here, it'll probably take two launches to do. We hold the alpha joint here also. One for standardization, it's already designed. <clears throat> and we can make good use of the flexibility of being able to rotate this panel with respect to this one <clears throat> when people start criticizing by saying that if you have this in gravity gradient mode and you happen to have the sun directly above, then this is going to shield this. Well, it, not necessarily if you scissor them apart and you, I mean, the cheapest thing we can have is a computer program. It doesn't weigh very much and the computer program just directs where, you, where the panels are pointed as a function of time. But what I'm showing here is the orbiter dock, uh, <clears throat> and there would be a, a propulsion capability here and down at this end that's removable so that I could take this piece and extend the truss going down to the other end. What I'm showing here are two lab modules and a pressurized logistics module and a Soyuz uh, off the four radial ports. The axial port, one of them is uh, Dr. the shuttle and the other one is available and uh, you'll see a little, little bit later the detailed structure of how that truss is uh, attached. <clears throat> but anyway, keep in mind that uh, the heart of the whole thing, the whole station that holds everything together, the glue is one node. <clears throat> we have uh, several options that we're looking at, uh, that NASA is looking at. Uh, and option B is the baseline and of course that has two nodes in it. As we did at Skylab, we built two Skylabs. Uh, a responsible nation should have a backup node for the first one you build in case something happens to that <coughs> one launch or whatever. <clears throat> you really do have another one standing by, ready to fly. And I think a lesson learned from Skylab is if we've got something ready to fly, let's fly it. And that's part of this uh, program. <clears throat> 
Now, here is an option. If we start out with a node, and we, for geometry purposes, and it's not absolutely essential that, that these modules go off at 45 degrees to this direction, it's just convenient at first glance from using the trunnion attach points on the node where it uh, is stored in the cargo bag to go this way. And of course, these can go straight out also. But if I start here in, in two launches from the, the node launch, I can go at power this way or I can go this way. And you can take your pick. It may be best, and that's what we're showing right now for the rest of this, for an austere station to add power on one end only, but keep in mind it can always go on the other end. <coughs> now, this is what uh, kind of scared the redesign group. <laughs> and uh, we probably should have anticipated this. Uh, you can visualize maybe this uh, rotated so that, uh, or visualize yourself as the direction of flight is this way, and these panels would be rotated all 90 degrees. And uh, we probably have this, the direction of flight, so that this is in the arrow mode, and this would be going straight up, and these panels would be offset up above, and the other panels would be fore and aft. And that's a joined together two-element two facility. This is a maneuverable space spacecraft, and this is a maneuverable spacecraft. And if the mirror is up there, more than likely, this would be the life sciences one, and this would be the microgravity element. So you'd attach this to the mirror in some choice of fashion, and it would reside at the mirror. Let's see what the next one is. Uh, this, is a, this is an early drawing when we still had a lab module coming out from the node. The node is sort of hidden here, attached to the crystal, and then this is a, a module coming off in this direction in addition to the ones going here. And we've shown them the panels here with their uh, canted 30 degree cant from the horizontal next. <clears throat> now some of the things that we've done is to take a cargo bay docking facility that's in the orbiter and put it on the end of the node. And when, it, when you do, you have an airlock and it goes up through the truss, two different pieces of the truss joined here and we attach this node in a, in a much more substantial way than is presently being done. This piece of truss is, is the one that uh, uh, angles in like this because it has the radiators that uh, then rotate around. Uh, in the present freedom. So we just use bits and pieces. Uh, and there's another uh, blow up of that. Let's go back to the first one. Well, no, this one. You see the Canadian mobility device up here, if this is not present, it can move up and down. Unimpeded. And you can have the orbiter down here. Uh, there's several combinations. It looks like uh, what we have is generally consistent to the best way uh, of having essentially a male, female at either end of uh, the node that's here for uh, docking and attachment to the orbiter and attachment to the mirror. Now, let's look just briefly for <coughs> refreshment what Space Station Freedom was back last fall. <coughs> First element launched and so forth up to uh, six man tended and uh, uh, permanently manned at uh, 17 flights. This is what we would put up first, and then we just add another section to it and a node uh, later. So we're cutting out a couple of uh, lights in here, but when you start considering that from the node, which is the key to power, the number of launches it takes to get there uh, is a measure of how much it costs, how many pieces of truss. So I'm just eliminating sections here. And um, I sent the initial briefing to uh, the redesign engineers at Johnson and at Marshall here, people doing it. Uh, I didn't get much of a response from people here, but I, this is uh, how the option A uh, has grown and evolved. These are truss sections, schematically sections here, two panels and 
solar panels and one panel out here. And it shows how the module and then the node are sort of attached to this M1 truss. Uh, notice the way that the module is attached here. It bears a striking similarity when you look at the details of, of how option A here at Marshall attached their uh, node. <clears throat> I'll give a comment about what they did with the node, uh, which is very clever, and it was an option that we looked at. <clears throat> Essentially, what they did is took, took a node, and they call it a common module, a lab and a half. And that's very nice. Uh, the, the node already, with a small cylindrical section, is pretty heavy for a one shuttle launch if you put everything in it. <clears throat> if you take that small cylindrical section and add two larger ones, that come from a lab module, that's a lot of change in paperwork. <clears throat> and it's also, if you put all the racks in there, uh, it's going to be very heavy, even to 28 degrees. And it's almost impossible that you would consider that as going to uh, 51 degrees. But it's a great idea because you don't have to then outfit a uh, pressurized logistics module. And uh, it probably be looked at that. Now, <clears throat> without the uh, Bus one in option A, uh, they need a few more sections of truss, a few more than than, uh, than I would employ, about at least one more. But certainly they <clears throat> then, with the bus one, reduce the number of pieces of truss so that they have a common module and two pieces to power. So it is doable, just what I'm talking about, but they chose to take the alpha joint out, and because it's there, and it helps rocket time some to keep it there. Uh, the drawings are already made, and it's a <clears throat> work package interface. In other words, uh, JSC designs the truss and then se essentially, figuratively or literally, sends the truss to rocket time, and rocket time puts their stuff in it, and then sends it back and we launch it. So that's that first launch. And if we can keep that the way it is, that's going to eliminate an awful lot of work and, and keep uh, a lot of safety. This is essentially the choices of option A right now. And uh, they fly this option in uh, aero mode. Aero mode means to decrease the drag by uh, flying it and put the truss section in the direction of flight. <coughs> and since they don't have an alpha joint, they have beta angles that go this way. So they, part of the time, fly with the panels this way. This is the direction of flight. And part of the time, with the panels this way. They have an alpha joint. Take the choice and fly wherever they want. Thanks. <clears throat> now, this is uh, Aviation Week's version of the Big Dan. And uh, going back about a, a year ago, we, Ron and I, distributed a number of documents, even down here. I think it was a 47 page uh, document showing the history <coughs> of uh, Skylab and uh, external tank possibilities. If I had it to do over again, uh, clearly I would eliminate the dependence on the shuttle as the only way to get things up there. And the shuttle dependency is what determines the size and weight of the different pressurized pieces. And that if, if you feel you're really cloistered by shuttle launch things, as I was two, three years ago, then everything has to be made up of modules, but <clears throat> uh, pressurized modules in the center of an area can have attached to it in several more clever ways than one long truss the various utilities that are needed. Now here is a pressurized can and here is a solution of attaching uh, radiators, thrusters, and the uh, panels. <clears throat> we tried this once on Skylab, attaching the panel to the side of, and for, for reasons that are probably unrelated, they had to do with the micrometeoid. Uh, anyway, it, it didn't quite go right, and they lost half the solar power on Mars. <clears throat> but that's okay, JSC has always been persistent about their approach to things. Uh, this is not the way I would have configured this at all, because they're very power limited. These are really only two sets of panels. And, and uh, I almost couldn't believe it when I saw this diagram. I thought, surely <clears throat> this is just 
the bottom view looking up at the underside of the panels. <clears throat> and since this is uh, uh, called solar inertial or pointing at the sun all the time, surely the sun is in this direction and the other side of the panels is what is pointed at the sun. But I read further and uh, discovered that, the, that that's not the case, I don't believe. <clears throat> they deploy these panels and then they cover them up with radiators and then put modules on here and further cover them up. Um, and I, uh, I don't blame the Japanese for saying that during the, during the daylight hours when they'd like to look down, they're sort of prevented from looking down. <clears throat> so let's show you just a, uh, uh, this is an in route um, diagram of transitioning between a way of dealing with it that was sort of pared back in the, in the way it probably should be done. And it's, it takes struts basically that originate in the geometric center of this can, but they're hinged here and then they fold back. And they fold back and you all carry umbrellas quite frequently and you know that you can open up an umbrella and you can hinge a few things here and here. This is a square around here. And, and it's that square that's like this square here that deploys outward and and has braces that also snap into position so that at the end of this square down here I have uh, my offset thrusters with their moment arm and up in this point I have the main attach points at each four corners <clears throat> for panels coming in this direction and in this direction and uh, the boxes that these two deploy from would be folded together and along this square and the two that deploy from this thing would be folded together. But these two would be folded together here. And the ones that deploy uh, would be folded along this part. So as all those things kind of fold in together in the area covered by the shroud, uh, they're all protected and they deploy. And now, that's not a big deal to engineer that. It's a big deal to do it in 90 days, however. Uh, this, uh, and probably the module should come out from the area between the two braces instead of uh, between them here, this way, the way we're showing them here. Uh, I, I put them out this way because um, I thought I might deploy these panels first and then add these panels later. <clears throat> but I'm not really trying to suggest what we should do now because I don't think the big can is the way to go. <clears throat> but if we were to do it, I think all of them ought to come out at the same time. And if we do that, then I think the modules, where they're located, uh, ought to make more sense. So that uh, tension <coughs> cables can attach from here to here and give additional strength to the compression struts that are there. Anyway, this, this is what uh, it would be very nice to do around the turn of the century. Uh, if we put this module in low Earth orbit, we should have a duplicate. <clears throat> and that duplicate uh, can be purchased by some private concern and put up as a hotel in space, because by that time we may have cheaper access to space and we may be able to start taking tourists up. <clears throat> a further refinement of this and a propulsion system that puts it into orbit can be used uh, after we re-engineer uh, the third version of this to handle cosmic radiation and, uh, and higher orbit conditions. And we have a propulsion system <clears throat> that puts it into orbit. We can also put a propulsion system with just fuel in it and attach the two together, and that sucker can go to L1. And it's that kind of an integrated plan that I think we need to develop. Uh, so that's the future, and we shouldn't start wasting a big can concept on something that's premature and compromised from the very beginning. <clears throat> now, this is maybe the way the Russians, when they came over, would like to have us do things. This is almost identical to the beer two that you saw before, and uh, we're just attaching modules on here. <clears throat> and it's a good idea, uh, but I think these ought to have their own power supply, their own utilities, and it ought to be detachable. And we'll sit and negotiate 
exactly the configuration and whose panels are going to shadow whose panels. <clears throat> and if you don't like it, we'll just move away and you play your game and I'll play my game. But none of the options that are contemplating going to 51.6 degrees are thinking of doing anything other than being in the same sky. Maybe not even in the same, well, you're, if you're at that inclination and a slightly different altitude, you're going to precess apart. But if you control the station keeping, they can be within a couple of miles of each other. And a uh, and big deal. You can talk on a ham radio back and forth. You might be able to wave. But there's a lot more you can do. And that is come together, join, and then separate. Mutually support each other. And that's what that facility that's in the same orbit ought to really be able to do. Uh, all right. <clears throat> now, this, this uh, it begins the, the present uh, briefing of Eagle Station. And we, I've gone through a couple of different possible names uh, for what I'm talking about. And I guess the current one right now is a science-based eagle instead of space station freedom. We're into name-changing. SDI is no longer SDIO. It's BMDIO or something. <clears throat> it may do about the same thing for a period of time, but the perception of change is what's important. Uh, and, and I think a, a name change is very important in whatever we're doing. It's not important right now to, to George Brown because he wants to preserve freedom-derived components, and I'm right with him. We've sunk a lot of work and effort and time and money into producing the freedom elements, and we should use those, and as far as the public is concerned, those are freedom-derived. But I think whenever the compromise comes about, <clears throat> the name changes in order, and I'm number one in line. <laughs> These are the objectives uh, that we're trying to do, a uh, 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 bare bones, reduce the development cost by taking advantage of what we've done already, share the burdens with uh, international and but meet the agreements we've already made, and provide uh, an option to, to bring things together. <clears throat> uh, I've long felt that uh, introducing dual launches, uh, we, we certainly have uh, come a long way since I first messed around with my thesis uh, selection at MIT in 1961 and 62 on the subject of rendezvous. We know how to do that. It's rather routine. Uh, and it has its uh, pitfall sometimes, but uh, there are a lot of reasons why a dual launch assembly gets two cargos up there, and, and you can put two orbiters up there if you want, but it's not necessary, and it really taxes the launch if it's two orbiters, part of a dual launch. But if you put an ELV and an orbiter up there <coughs> and combine the assets and then assemble what you have, uh, you're getting around the fact that you, neither vehicle can take that full cargo <coughs> up there, but together you can do sort of a mini rendezvous and then assemble what it is. And you'll see where we use that option in here. And certainly we have growth when it's affordable. Um, that scares a number of people in Congress. <laughs> uh, you want to tell me what you really had in mind here? <laughs> it's, a, it's a balanced program, certainly, uh, between crew tended facilities and, uh, and crew permanence, and, and because it's at a higher inclination, we can begin to do more in the uh, observation of the environmental changes that are taking place. So the big, the big features that we have is a very austere configuration, and we're, we're uh, paying a, a tremendous amount of attention to the uh, international hardware. If anything, we're enhancing the international's role of participation. And uh, I haven't really said this yet, but uh, we already own 40 to 41 percent of the racks in each of the European module and the Japanese module. Why isn't that enough to start out with? Why don't we just defer <coughs> the lab where it is and defer the hab where it is and take the insides and put them, put the insides that we want into a pressurized logistics module <coughs> that's easy to take up and back down again 
Uh, when it begins to get a little smelly, maybe you just bring it back down again and take another one up there. Maybe that's a better idea than having a cab module up there that, that is really too heavy to bring down as is. I haven't uh, of course, that idea, perhaps as much as it really should be pushed, uh, the interchangeability of the uh, living conditions. Um, uh, we can really have, with one shuttle launch, a functional uh, science station. If we choose, in our order of putting them up there, to take the node up first, then we just have enhanced the capability of the mirror, because that's where we'd attach it first. If instead we put up uh, a power package in launches one and two, dual launch, we essentially have something that an extended duration orbiter can go up and attach to the power package and stay up there without having to take all its power up there. So we have a major contribution. After one shuttle launch, we are in business in one way or the other. And we get uh, permanent manning by launch seven. That's not seven shuttle launches. Three. Anyway, here's what we start out with. The glue that holds it all together, a node. Probably we would find that this would be the first we'd want to come up with, and then this, and the ESA, these two together. And as soon as we have Soyuz up there, with some living space, we're capable of permanently manning something, especially if we're close by to the uh, this uh, is showing flight one with a Titan delivering power module. Flight two uh, <clears throat> delivers a truss uh, spacer section, and the two join together, and in this mode, they station keep with the beer. Right. <clears throat> and that, now the Titan brings up uh, a node to the vicinity, and uh, the orbiter brings this up, and uh, we, these two join together, then they attach. Uh, this to the to what's already up there, <clears throat> and and we're in business at, at that point. Really, we have a pressurized module, we have power, and it's only the second uh, shuttle flight. <clears throat> now, I have um, suggested uh, that we use protons uh, at the Japanese uh, Russian summit. That that we also take advantage of the benevolent <coughs> gesture toward the Japanese and offer to launch there their uh, module, which is overweight. Uh, so it would be hard for us to launch it right now, especially into the, the higher inclination orbit. So the Japanese win, we win, and the Russians win. And it's rare that you have a, a situation where you can come up with something where everybody comes out a winner. <clears throat> At the same time, we can then uh, help assemble this by bringing up the remaining portions of the Japanese uh, overload condition. Now, uh, at, at about this point, either concurrent with this launch, I don't, I don't have any doubt that the Russians can launch this and launch this within a couple of days of each other. <clears throat> so that this ACRV could be launched with an American crew at the same time that this is up there and, and we have PMC. Um, one of the strong reasons of wanting to go to 51 degrees is so that we don't take up the ACRV in the cargo bay of the shuttle, a costly delivery method. Uh, and I guess the idea is you bring it back down again when you want to refurbish it. I'm not convinced that uh, an ACRV really needs to be refurbished. What's wrong with what the Russians are doing now every six months, <clears throat> they bring it back down again as a replacement. They probably do that more for their crew reasons because they only have one delivery system, and they, and they might as well launch a crew every six months. But if we were to alternate shuttle and launch a crew with an ACRV, we might find that we could extend the, the, the life of a Soyuz ACRV to 12 months or 18 months without any big deal, without any big expense. We've studied this now for a while. Why don't we launch it on a Soyuz, which it was designed to launch? And in uh, November, or sometime, I think in 95, one American is going to trust the Russian Soyuz launcher and go up in it. If we trust one American, why not two more? Why, why should we launch the damn thing empty? It, I mean, these things should make sense, and this makes sense. What it is we're doing otherwise doesn't make sense. 
Now we can defer this to the next two launches. Uh, where we're now going to ask the Europeans to deliver their own module. Well, I, I would have thought they would be overjoyed to do this. And I was really surprised. The, the first reaction I got from the, the ESA people was, we're not sure that, uh, that the interface of the launch environment is correct. We, we have a module, but we're not sure that it will work on our launch vehicle in the launch environment. Well, who would better know? Why is he asking me that? <laughs> I, I would sure think that they would be overjoyed to do that and to get our encouragement. Especially the French. Yeah. Anyway, this, this, this to me is a winner, and the Proton is a winner, and maybe a few more. I haven't put in a few more because Martin has a pretty big lobby, and so does the Air Force. And, and we want to keep them happy. We don't want them knocking this dual launch idea. Uh, we don't want to risk Neither do we want to risk a very high critical, high value critical item to a foreign launcher in deference to the, our responsibility to the taxpayers. That, so that's why I've used Titan's hand shovels for most of the other launches. Uh, we take the ESA up and then the space shuttle can deliver the pressurized logistics module. I think in, in all of these, you'll see that what I'm asking the shuttle to do on each of them is a very reduced payload that could very well be done to 51 degrees. And we could enhance in some way the Titan capability uh, and, and uh, assume that we have the Proton and, uh, and Ariane capability to put up what, what I'm showing here. I have six minutes. Who's board of directors meeting? <laughs> These two launches can go to either uh, add power on the top or they can add power on the other end and then at some point we can begin to, uh, to add the uh, additional node and grow it the way you and I know it really ought to grow at some point. But for purposes of uh, Science Station Eagle, this is uh, the completion of our obligations. <clears throat> and this is what it could look like attached to mirror one and uh, the next chart will give us mirror two. Now we're going to start putting on this again. <laughs> and, and this is just mirror two. Next. <laughs> and, incidentally, there's no reason, uh, go back to the other one. <laughs> there's no reason why this couldn't be the direction of flight uh, just as well. And, and decrease the, uh, the drag. Next one. Uh, this really shows that we're looking at three options here, and, and uh, I've toned down some of the words that we used for the options before. Uh, these are some of the competing items in the new initiatives as the administration sees it. That's not the, necessarily the way Congress sees it. Congress is going to put in funding of some sort, and it may not agree with the trade off that the White House and NASA have agreed to that that the more we spend on this, the less of this we have because there's a fixed amount. And, and who knows how that's going to play out this summer. Uh, but certainly the Eagle Station uh, is just as austere as the uh, uh, op option A. And, and NASA opens the door to one contractor, but, but not to one experienced, unbiased, uh, dedicated uh, to space future individual. <laughs> yeah. So this is what I think uh, we can do with this option, and uh, uh, I, I'm standing ready to uh, move this into the media and Space News, Aviation Week, uh, Newsweek as part of a larger one, and with CNN uh, starting the week of the, the 7th, and I'm meeting with, uh, I'm quite sure, with uh, Congressional freshman leadership, uh, and there are a lot of things that could be done if, as soon as we it becomes clear how the battle lines are forming, and it looks right now like uh, George Brown would like to get some uh, some congressional action in authorizing out by the time the uh, the administration comes out with their choice of which option it is. And I assume he has pretty good intelligence to know what that may be. 
Uh, let's shift gears a little bit into two other priority areas. This uh, is obviously air launch, and I'm relying on a lot of information that comes from OSC. <clears throat> These are uh, small launch vehicles. That, that, these are small launch vehicles, and so this is uh, on up into the future. And you can see uh, where some of these are. This, this is increasing technology. And over here is what the payload is. And you see they're not very big payloads. And this is the cost per pound. <clears throat> this is uh, a little bit more uh, back in the past. But what we're trying to do is to get down into this area here cost per pound. Uh, it, for very small payloads, the cost is going to be high. But as we get larger ones, it should come down and not go back up again. <laughs> uh, where is Air Launch today? Well, you can read through this. Sometime this summer, uh, a 1011 is going to start taking uh, uh, enhanced Pegasus, what they call uh, XL. And uh, the next chart shows uh, and the XL Pegasus, the 30% uh, increase, and the, the, I could go in and tell you some story about the turbo. Let me put that back up here. Th this is using a, uh, an afterburner turbojet attached to a Pegasus, and, and it uh, increases uh, your performance tremendously. It's an air breather. You don't take the oxygen up, and it, it is a principle whose time has come, and it's exactly what Scott Crossfield was talking about, air breathers, except we decided to look with NASP at air breathers all the way, and what I'm suggesting is that air breathers may have a critical region somewhere around taking over at the subsonic delivery point with the, with the first stage that takes advantage of all the things we know about turbojets and the delivery capability to 40,000 feet. Then the air breather concept takes over, and if they're cheap enough initially and we aren't using them, throw them away. Uh, but then the rocket takes over from that point and, and puts the payloads into orbit. That's one of the next one. Th these are some of the things they found that we, that orbital science, that you need lift on, on what you drop from or separate at subsonic at 40,000 feet. And the top mount uh, doesn't appear to be practical, either for the AN-225 or the uh, 747. Uh, a lot of people would argue with that, who have vested interests in those uh, aircraft. Uh, but the separation dynamics are just not very good. Now that's one reason. The other reason is, if you start the design right from the beginning, unencumbered by meeting FAA and, and, and other certification requirements, you can come up with an experimental type certificate from something that can do tremendously greater performance uh, if you design a special purpose aircraft and you may only need one of them with the ability to have a backup when and if you need it. And that's the direction that I think we really ought to be going. <clears throat> this is the 1011 with the turbojet, uh, ran uh, after burning turbojets, and that's its pro flight profile. This is the turbo with the uh, essentially uh, a slightly enhanced Pegasus XL and after burning ramjets. Essentially, what is happening from 40,000 feet to 0.7 Mach is that 4,000 feet per second is being added before you light the engine, the solids, at an equivalent ISP of 2,000. Now that's tough to to turn your back on. And that's the thing that we're trying to enhance. You have to carry that capability that's really usable in this mid-range all the way to orbit, I think may not be appropriate. I think the rocket is the thing that's needed on into orbit. And I agree, that means three stages. But if we're clever about doing it, we don't have to have a standing army for each and every of those three stages. This is uh, an air-breathing growth vehicle. These are Castor 120s. These two would light for the first stage of its burn, followed by this one and, and another Castor 120. And these are symbolic of whatever the ramjet uh, combination would be. That's pretty heavy, 640,000 pounds. I wonder what will take it to 40,000 feet. 
Newton, this bears a striking resemblance to the Voyager. And it ought to because the same guy was involved in it. <laughs> uh, it's got a cockpit here. It, it can start out in a two engine version and then add the other five. Uh, I'd just as soon see him take the bend that's in the tail. And, and instead of the name I like for this Condor, <clears throat> we could call it Corsair because it could look like a Corsair with a gull wing here. It would give greater a payload capacity underneath these two central wings and, and move the engine out here and put two on this wing, four here and two here, and uh, we'd maybe be better off. <clears throat> this is the uh, launch configuration with the uh, 640,000 pound uh, delivery. And uh, how big is this? The next slide will show us how big it is. That's the 747 wing and fuselage. And this is beginning to push the maximum for existing runways. <laughs> That's fairly wide. Now, this is a, just a, a chart that shows what, what you can do with various air launchers, whether it's X-15 or S-1, XS-1. We can move up to this drop weight capability. And with all solids, this is the delivery to lo low Earth orbit. If we enhance uh, the rocket in true, all expendable still, we're up to about 30,000 pounds with this airplane <coughs> to low Earth orbit. And uh, orbital science really thinks that you can go from here, from this you could get a four-man spacecraft, and this is an eight-man spacecraft if you design it with uh, weight reductions in mind in the spacecraft. probably seen this as a competition to the fully rocket up and, and rocket landing. Um, this is uh, taking everything all the way. It's bound to cost a fair amount of money and it's either all or nothing. Either it's like DCX. Well, it, you have some suborbital missions, I'm sure. <clears throat> but uh, these are, in my estimation, fairly high risk and potentially high cost but very high potential return. And we certainly ought to be examining uh, these concepts, but I don't think we ought to rule out perhaps other concepts that may have a bit more resiliency. <clears throat> this looks an awful lot like a NAS uh, junior version. Uh, and, and this is Boeing's uh, two-stage uh, entry into the ball game. Let's look at some of the characteristics. We don't really have time to go into this, but it's using an SSME in the booster. It's really an SSD, a supersonic transport, that uh, orbital flight requirements uh, are what Boeing would like to have subsidized a supersonic transport for. <laughs> and then instead of uh, the, the uh, orbital stage, underneath it put baggage and uh, and where the fuel is for the SSME, that's where you and I go. <laughs> um, but this is a, a program that uh, clearly is going to be a major commitment and cost a lot of money and does not have to be done in a, in a private enterprise mode. Here's another uh, shuttle enhancement. Why don't we take the existing shuttle and uh, have it carry oxygen tanks portion of them and throw away hydrogen tanks and then fly back to booster and put four SSMEs and a very talented uh, engineer is working on this uh, and it's and it's a way of prolonging the life of the shuttle but I don't think it's what we ought to do that's that's big changes and I don't think we need to recover the tank that much really it doesn't belong back here on earth it belongs in orbit <laughs> Now, this is a, a, a progression tree of shuttle evolution, and this is a new subject. This is the last one, and I'm going to go quickly. But this is the uh, original shuttle with solid rocket boosters. We put liquid rocket boosters here, but we keep the original shuttle, and then we eventually go to a flyback uh, booster. This is an unmanned version of this. This is cargo uh, without... Uh, engines on the tank, it's a strap-on, and it's essentially shuttle C. This now uh, goes through the second major modification of a shuttle evolution, when you can afford it, <clears throat> and that is to uh, have a new tank uh, 
and you go to a boat tail orbiter and you put the engines on the tank. This really doesn't belong down here because uh, in the flyback booster configuration without uh, wings on it, where you start developing this capability, that's without the wings on it when you ought to be launching this and calling it upper region starlift or space lift. And, and this program should attract both the Air Force and NASA as a means of extending our present capability. And in my estimation, uh, right where we are in 1993 or 94, the only hope that I see in the Western world for a heavy lift booster is to gradually go this way in the interest of shuttle economy and safety. If we keep a flight rate going of eight per year, by the time we get to 2000, most probability people think that the chance of reaching the year 2000 at a flight rate of uh, eight per year, the probability is about 20% of not having uh, crew loss. And that's pretty, pretty low. But those are the numbers, and those are the flashy numbers and people will pick that up and say, oh, Buzz says it's a 20% chance or an 80% chance we're going to kill somebody by 2000. Well, it's an either or. You either have one or you don't. And we sure didn't have those kind of failures in, uh, in Apollo. And we certainly hope that we won't have one. But when you start looking at the number of things that can go wrong and the numbers, they just add up to be that. And it's not what you'd like to bet on, I don't think. <clears throat> Let's look just a little bit more in detail. Uh, these are uh, jet engines on the nose and uh, wings here on the bottom. And in order to do this, it's much better to have overthrust than underthrust. So this is proposed as a two F1 engine booster. There may be a version that's useful in development with a one F1. Uh, I have to think that we should move ahead in technology and maybe look at a US built RD-170 by Pratt & Whitney or one off the shelf, depending on what the State Department and DOD and other people say uh, the customer, which is us and the government, should do. But there is that uh, availability of those uh, engines to, to do this, and competition is great. And I'd like to see the two compete, but not spend a lot of money on, uh, on that competition or waste too much time. Now this shows the, the engines of four SSMEs on the bottom. So this is the enhanced tank. But if we take it step by step, <clears throat> this, this is essentially an airplane, and it can be developed in prototype versions, horizontal takeoff with a cockpit in it. It can also be parallel developed as a rocket without the wings and the engines, and used as a rocket to give even greater capacity to the shuttle as it's first put on it, to give even greater capacity to the initial uh, unmanned uh, space lifter missions. Uh, and I think next slide will show that. <clears throat> if we rotate that one around, that's not going to take off horizontally. Uh, this, is a, this is a Titan upper stage. And this, with the wings and everything, I'm told delivers 44,000 pounds to lower earth orbit. So if we took the flyback capability and said, initially, we're going to do this. Even the prototype of this, with, with one engine down here, can capture the low end of space lifter. But the lobby for STMEs and um, solids and other components of um, ALS, NLS, and space lifter expendable is very strong. Uh, and who are the users? The Air Force? NASA? I don't really think so. This is a strong potential substitute. At the lower end, we move into the space lifter capability in commercial activities with some kind of air launch capability. In the upper end, this capability exists. And eventually, we can be building this while we're enhancing the lift capability and safety of the shuttle system with a liquid booster, satisfying the space lifter requirements. We can be designing this and then implementing this cheaper, bigger tank, more capable. We can build into it perhaps some, some on-orbit capability when it's left on-orbit 
this time, and we can build in the recoverable engine package. And then one at a time, we take the orbiters offline, continue to fly the three as is with the enhanced liquid boosters, but we update the orbiter to what it ought to be to make it last longer. And this is moving in the direction of the DC-3. We're going to prolong the life of assets that we already have. <clears throat> I never would have thought I would be trying to enhance the lifetime of the shuttle a couple of years ago, but this appears to me in the world conditions right now as our best bet for incrementally improving the U.S. launch capability, satisfying NASA safety, Air Force space lifter, and civil space exploration big booster. Um, the big booster that can come out of this uh, you can try and understand this one while I'm saying a few things. The, the, uh, the one thing that I think would let us begin in our nation begin to use and plan on using the Energia capability is to have in the pipeline a U.S. improvement to that then the companies involved in competing for that would not have that strong an objection to using the Energia to put up the big can and to put up a few other things downstream. The time is not ripe for that. The Energia needs more test flight uh, background. Speaking of the Energia uh, and other basic booster changes from the Saturn V. The Saturn V was serial. We had the first stage and then the second stage, and then we used the third stage to put us into orbit. And that's very efficient to use the stage you're going to later use to add that additional velocity. What really means is the S2 could be dropped sooner so that the velocity needed to get orbital didn't have to carry along the empty S2 stuff. So using the S4B to put, go into orbit and then using it to do TLI is a wonderful way of doing things. But today it looks as though the first two stages are better done by a core stage and strap-ons. The strap-ons, like the Atlas, drop away when their fuel is consumed and the thrust level gets up higher. We drop that stage and a half away, but it's parallel burn. Now what I'm proposing here rather quickly is a parallel burn from S2 staging on to the lunar surface and back. And, and these are the parallel burns. This is the core stage here that makes the landing, and in some cases, uh, actually makes the, uh, the ascent from the lunar surface. But we put engines on the side that all burn suborbital using this fuel, that's uh, four tanks, three around here, and one on the top to get into orbit. Then we've got six tanks around here. Four of them will be used for TLI, and then we'll land with two tanks and leave those on the surface. The framework can support either storable propellant, lunar lander, or a cryo, which is a down, change the crew, and back up again while we have one or two of these as ACRVs on the lunar surface. If we play our cards right, uh, well, also, this is no crew and escape tower up here. We don't want to risk the crew on all the things that have to happen on this. We put the crew up in the most reliable, the safest way and I think it's air launch of sorts. And that is joined after these are separated. We put the crew here either by putting the whole crew module in or just transferring the crew. Transferring the crew is more likely the way it would be done. <clears throat> the cargo doesn't have to ever stop. It just goes on to the lunar surface. The cargo is essentially the same. And in route, after TLI, you can transfer the, the cargo that's this way to, to have it this way with the landing gear. Uh, I think strong consideration should be given to, to designing this initially so that this crew lander that can take four people to the lunar surface, if I require it to only go to L1, that's less fuel <coughs> or more payload. So what I do is keep the fuel the same and it only goes to L1, but with an eight man or bigger crew module, take the landing gear up and a few other things. Then I take the cargo and I grow that into a reusable lander from the lunar surface up to L1 and back. 
It's either surface-based or it's L1-based, depending on where we get the oxygen and, and the hydrogen. So this is this is kind of a new concept, and this I think also will have use in uh, in Mars applications. <clears throat> and of course, the big pan that's in the program uh, is the place where you turn around. The guys that go here, you deliver. Uh, when when you're into this mode, you take the four empty cans to L1 and you start building yourself a, a big facility. You take the empty ones down to the surface as cargo and fill them up on the surface and use them for subsequent, eventually you can use them to propel other tanks back into low Earth orbit potentially. What is needed is a master plan that starts out from the situation we're in today that grows us slowly. And there is no master plan, I don't believe in NASA today. <clears throat> but I think you people are in favor of space-bearing settlement of colonies. And we have to get behind something that, that isn't just a Mars mission, or isn't just a return to the moon, but grows in a pro productive way, step by step, from the dilemma that we're in today which really isn't that bad. I mean, it's an opportunity to change, but we should change and, and pair back, but pair back and know where we'd like to go in the future. I apologize for the tracks that are a little uh, late in getting started, and we'll just move a little faster in the board. But thank you all for uh, paying attention. And when we've got uh, some need for your concerted support to support this or other things, we'll try and get in touch with you. But thank you very much.